Welcome to Dr. Bill Waddell's Bible study over the seven letters to the seven churches. Lesson 5, Church at Thyatira. Let's, uh, let's start our study. We're in the letter to the church at Thyatira. It's the longest letter by far, and it's the longest or oldest church age uh, in existence. So we're going to be considering that today in uh, chapter 2, beginning down in verse 18. So let's pray together and ask God help uh, as we try to comprehend what he's got for us. God, we humble ourselves before you, before your word, which is you speaking to us, and we know that's true everywhere, but how much more so, or how much more evident is it, is it when you've penned, when you've dictated these letters to us? And so, God, we pray you enable us to hear them, to learn from them, to learn the things that we're supposed to know, to learn history, uh, to comprehend what you really mean about our lives, and to first of all see ourselves in these letters before, before we see anything else. And we just ask God for your um, continued uh, presence with your church, your hand upon us, Lord, bringing us to repentance, bringing us to the place where uh, we are everything in every way what you want us to be. We ask your blessings on our time and our Bible study. Thank you for your word and our time. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So let's, let's read this letter, and then uh, we'll hop into uh, some of the particulars, or all the particulars of it. Verse 18, to the angel or the messenger of the church at Thyatira, write, the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire and his feet like burnished bronze, says this, I know your deeds. The same thing he says in all of them, right? So as you notice, seven churches, he says the same thing all seven times to him. I know what you're doing. He's not guessing. He knows this. You're not hiding a thing from him. You think you are. You're, you're only fooling yourself. I know your deeds and your love. Notice it's not all bad in this letter. There's going to be a lot of bad here, but, but it's not all bad. I know your deeds, your love and faith and service and perseverance, and that your deeds of late are greater than at first. So, well, that's, that's, that's the good on the report card. It's not going to be good after this. But I have this against you, that you tolerate the woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, Nevertheless, teaches and leads my bondservants astray so that they commit acts of immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. Not everybody that calls himself good or good. Because you call yourself a Christian doesn't make you a Christian because you call yourself a pastor or a leader or, I don't know, some educated person in the Bible or whatever. Does it mean for that reason that you're so? And this woman was that in every way, a liar. And he gave her time to repent, and she does not want to repent of her immoralities. Behold, I will cast her upon a bed of sickness. And those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation. Now that's a very foreboding term uh, in this book. Because great tribulation is not a good thing. And uh, so it's sort of weird because we've always been taught and I've always believed that the church would never go into the great tribulation. The only people that go into the great tribulation are those who do not believe in Christ. So automatically you're seeing something about this church. Everybody that calls them a Christian is a Christian. A lot of people are Christians by default. I'm, well, I'm not a Muslim, well, and I'm not a Jew, and I live in America, so I must be a Christian, right? I hold Christian morals and certain values and stuff. But that, it's not for that reason that you're, you're a Christian. Like I said, you're not any more Christian than you are a hamburger because you walked into Whataburger. Um, you know, even if you call yourself a Whataburger, you know, it doesn't make any difference. So, so wow so this is already very tough i mean you're she's saying he's saying this about this church that there's a lot of them that are unsaved and, and unless they repent of her deeds and i will kill her children with pestilence the word literally there is death i will kill them with death and that's sort of a redundant isn't it sort of like i don't know if y'all watched the three stooges remember uh they would say to each other if you die i'll murder you sort of like well, you, you know i mean he's already dead it's like, I will kill you with death? Seems, seems like a strange term, and we're going to see how it's not near as strange. It's very prophetic about what happens during this church age. And all the churches will know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts, and I will give to each one according to your deeds. But I say to you, the rest who are in Thyatira, notice there's not all of them are bad, not all of them are non-Christians. There's a lot of them who are. Who do not hold to these teachings, who have not known the deep things of Satan, as they call them, I place no other burden over you. Nevertheless, what you have, hold fast until I come. This is the first letter 
in which he mentions the second coming. He does in the, in the, in the final four. The first three, he never mentions his coming. First, starting with this one, and the remainder, he mentions his coming. He who overcomes. Now, there's been a change now. The, the, the word to the overcomer is now in the body of the letter. It's not in the postscript. So something, something uh, has changed in, in, in the sense of the, just the diagrammatically in the, in the uh, letter. He who overcomes. And he who keeps my deeds until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron. By the way, are you ready for that? You're a Christian? You ready to rule the nations? Yeah, you get ready for it. That's what he says. To him who overcomes. You're an overcomer if you've trusted Christ. So you overcome him because you overcome the world because you've trusted him who has overcome the world. I'll give authority over the nations. He shall rule them with a rod of iron, and as the vessels of potter are broken in pieces, as I also receive authority from my Father. Wow. And I will give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So this longest letter, it's the longest church age, still in existence today. It started way back in the 600s, and uh, st still pretty much going strong. Uh, just, just a review of the themes of these letters thus far. First of all, Ephesus, Jesus wants our devotion. That's the basic theme of that letter. Uh, in Smyrna, Jesus is with us in our suffering and persecutions. In, in Pergamum, uh, he tells us, as we saw last time, not to join with false teachings. Do not marry the world. Do not make what seems a reasonable compromise with the world. Do not be unequally yoked with the world. Do not. And in Thyatira, we're going to see what happens when you don't do that. And that's the story of the Thyatira church. They, they didn't listen to Jesus. They, they made these seemingly reasonable compromises, and the product of this unholy union is what we're going to get here in Thyatira. Just some details about the city itself. Uh, on the road today, if you go to modern, modern Istanbul, and you drive to Izmir, or you ride on the road to Izmir, which is the you know, ancient Smyrna, on the way, you run through a city called Akazar. It was, it's the modern-day city of the ancient Thyatira. It's on the same spot. Still there, still has the city. Uh, the ruins are still there of Thyatira. During New Testament times, it stood in a juncture of three roads, which led one led to Pergamon, one led to Sardis, one led to Smyrna. The town was called Semiramis. You remember our study last time. Semiramis was the name of the queen who started the Babylonian religion. Her son, who was supposedly posthumously conceived by, by uh, uh, that guy, uh, Nimrod, right? And uh, her son named Tammuz. She started this mother-son religion in which they worshiped this mother and they prayed to them and they, all this horrible uh, worship practices that they participated in. And so the city itself was a name Semiramis, so that's not a good name. It was a Lydian name. Uh, it, she was called the queen of paganism and queen of heaven, basically. Uh, later on, the town received the name of Thyatira. The Greeks renamed it. The name Thyatira just simply means daughter. It means daughter. And uh, probably is there, probably Jesus refers to this, this city and the name of it in particular because of this woman, this Jezebel, who as we're going to see is a very particular daughter. She has a very unique uh, history. Uh, became the center of trade guilds, uh, effectively ancient unions. Uh, these trade guilds, if you were a tent maker, Tom and I were tent makers, and we wanted to make good money, we'd have to join the guild. The only way we could do it. If we were on the outside, we would get just basically the periphery of business. Because if anybody wanted a tent, they would go to the trade guild. They wouldn't come to us. So we would only get personal references. And everybody else would go to the trade guild. The trade guild was actually very effective, very similar to our unions today. Very highly organized. Protected its members. Unfortunately had, and the problem with Tom and I would be that it had, they had their own patron deities. So if Tom and I are believers and we would be a part of this trade guild, we basically have to sign on as being worshipers of this whatever patron deity that they had. So that's a problem for us. And Tom, because he's not as much of a strong Christian as I am, he just says, right, Tom? He just says, he says, he says, I got to feed my family. It's a reasonable compromise. Yeah, got to feed his dog. It's a reasonable compromise, right? I'm going to make better money. Doesn't God want me to make better money? Who cares if I have to do a little bit of uh, bowing the knee to this, this patron uh, deity, whoever he or she uh, may be? And unfortunately, what he's done is, is he's, picked his, he's picked his income over God. Now, who do you trust more? You trust your own hands to work harder, or do you trust God to provide for you? And so this becomes an issue for the church. This is where the church is. It was known in particular uh, for its dyes, uh, especially the color purple. 
You remember the book of Acts, Paul and Silas, they go, they get the Macedonian call, they go over to Macedonia, they land in Philippi, they begin preaching there, they don't find any men, they go down to a river, there's no synagogue there, and the first convert is a woman named Lydia. Lydia is a sales rep from Thyatira, she's a seller of purple dyes, remember she's living in, in Macedonia, in Philippi in particular, because she's there to sell for these trade guilds, these, these dye companies, and she becomes the first convert in, in the continent of Europe, uh, this woman. So anyway, just a connection there with, with the book of Revelation. I'm sorry, Revelation with, with Acts. Thyatira represents the medieval church. AD 600 to AD 1500 is, is the, the, the church age doesn't end, but this is basically the time when it's the only age and from that point on, the Sardis age, and then the Philadelphian age, and then now the Laodicean age is now, but they're all going on at the same time. The dangers, listen, the 600 to 1500 is when the dangers of the church arose from within the church, from within, inside the church. Uh, let's look at verse 18. Notice we're going to bre break down some of these verses here. Jesus calls himself something very unique here, not, not unique to you, but it's unique to the revelation. He says in verse 18, the Son of God... It's the only time Jesus is referred to as the Son of God in the whole book of Revelation. Why is it unique? Why does he pin it here? Why does he hold it out for just this one? Apparently, it's where the issue is. This is, this is a title of his, his power and his authority, and he uses it apparently because that's where the challenge is. Eyes like a flame of fire and feet like burnished bronze. These are all symbols of judgment. So he states his authority. And he states the fact that he's the judge. It's kind of like last week. If your father calls home and says, listen, I'm coming home with my belt. Why is, I mean, he wears his belt every day. Why does he have to point out the fact that he's bringing his belt with him? Because somebody's in trouble. He's got to say he's got eyes like flame of fire and feet like burnished bronze. Somebody's in trouble, and they are, you know, as we just saw in that letter. Not all is negative to the church. Like I said, he, there are some there who are doing things well and even have improved, and he's commending them there in verse 19 for those things. Puts us in a strange position in our thinking, because if you know anything about the medieval church, you know it was basically bad. And not just bad, it was horrible. Uh, uh, Single-handedly responsible for the dark ages. If we live in a dark day, you want to know why? It's the church. She's the problem. You don't, like it? you don't like how dark things are? You know who's responsible? We are. We are. The church is the only light. So I've only got one light bulb, and, and the room's dark, what's the fault? It's not the wall's fault. Can't be the carpet's fault. It's the light bulb's fault. We only have one light in the world today. It's the church. And so if the, church, if the world's dark, go to the light bulb. Light bulb's responsible. The church is responsible for the darkness. Of course, I'm a part of the church too, so I'm not part of any fingers except to myself. But, but we were familiar with the medieval church and, and huge problems, if you know anything about our history, anything about mid, medieval Europe, medieval Asia, medieval uh, Northern Africa and the Middle East, horrible, huge problems, uh, gross misapplication of scripture, single-handedly responsible for the dark ages, and yet Jesus commends them for some things. So there's things going on here that you don't know about historically. There were true Christians. They were honest believers. But, but in the previous church age, the Pergamum church, when, when basically they filled the churches with unconverted people, people who just actually hadn't ever accepted Christ, they just said, since you're a Roman, you're now a Christian. These people just brought their paganism in, and so the church became so diluted, it hard, the, the influence of the church became so diluted, and the world became very dark as a result of it. This one I want to camp out on here is in verse 20, though. This woman... I have this against you, that you tolerate this woman, Jezebel. Now, who was this woman? Well, first of all, in a local sense, in the sense of the church that John's writing this letter to, or Jesus is dictating this letter to, that existed when John is sitting on the island of Patmos, it was just some lady in the church who was, who was bad. They needed to get rid of her. That's what they needed to do. And in fact, the only problem that Jesus has with them is they don't raise an adequate protest against her. They just let her do her stuff. And oh, well, she says she's a Christian. She says she's a nice lady. Everybody says, well, she's not. She's terrible. She's a backbiter and she's horrible and she teaches people wrong stuff, but they didn't raise an adequate protest against her. The chief sin, again, is failing to raise the chief sin of this church. The chief sin of the entire age is that they fail to raise a protest to the movement called this Jezebel movement that Jesus refers to here. It's false doctrine. 
It's, it's uh, paganism. Like I said, we've already had a marriage between the church and paganism, but they failed to stop it. They failed to put their foot down. Remember, this, this was, uh, the, the paganism that was brought in was this mother-son uh, uh, paganism where this, you had this adult woman and this infant son. It was the imagery throughout all paganism. They brought it into the Catholic Church, and, and it ceased to be Semiramis and Tammuz. It became Mary and Jesus. They just changed the names. But just like they did in, in the paganism, they prayed to the woman. They didn't pray to Jesus. Jesus was the baby. Or I should say, Tammuz was the baby. So they brought it into their church. That's why, where did the Catholic Church come up with all this praying to Mary stuff? There it is. Right there. Straight out paganism. Just simply changed the names. Didn't change any of the practices. Didn't change any of the beliefs whatsoever. They just simply converted the names. This is the way this religion spread through all the ancient world, just by changing names whenever it came up to a different culture or a different situation in religion. So this woman, Jezebel, is very, a very important name, a very representative name, and we need to understand who she is. And so in order to do that, we're going to have to go back. Hold your place here in uh, Revelation. We're going to come back. And I want us to go to 1 Kings. You find that? You know where 1 Kings is? right before 2 Kings. So, and there I turn to 2 Kings. 1 Kings. 1 Kings chapter 16. And uh, we'll start there. We're going to read several places all the way down through chapter 21, just several excerpts from, from this. So, first of all, who was this woman? She was an actual person. Uh, it's very interesting that uh, Thyatira is the word in Greek for daughter, and that's who this woman, her, her, all of her, this woman in, in Old Testament in the book of Kings, that's where authority comes from. Her authority comes from the fact that she's the daughter of the high priest of, the, of this pagan religion over in Lebanon or in uh, Phoenicia. And uh, so she's the daughter, she's the Thyatira of the king of Sidon. He was the high priest of Astarte, who was also called Ishtar or Asherah or Asterisk or Semiramis. It's the same religion. Uh, this guy murdered his predecessor. Uh, she marries King Ahab. King Ahab is a Jewish king. Now, the Jews weren't supposed to marry uh, pagans. They weren't. But he marries her, listen, because it's a reasonable compromise. Again, that's the MO of this church. They're making a reasonable, what seems like a reasonable compromise, but they're, they're compromising the purity of the church. Ahab compromises the purity of all Israel by taking this daughter of a Protestant, or I shouldn't say Protestant, of a pagan king, and this woman, and we come to know her as Jezebel, and uh, that, that's, that's her name. She's from Phoenicia. Uh, this reasonable compromise in the same way for the same sake that people were joining these trade guilds there in Thyatira. This woman brings with her in the book of Kings, brings with her her religion. She doesn't just bring it with her, she enforces it. Now that she's queen, she starts getting rid of all the prophets of God, and all the priests of God, and all the Levites, and anyone else who claims she's going to make her religion, which is the same Babylonian religion, the, the preeminent thing there in Israel. And she, like I said, she doesn't just introduce it. She enforces it. So let's read a little bit about her and about him, her husband, uh, King Ahab, Ch chapter 13, chapter 16, verses 30, and we'll go down through verse 33. It says, and Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord more than all who were before him. That's a huge statement right there. That's, a, that's an accomplishment because, man, there were some, you read the, the, just the list of kings that come before him, they were all bad. And it came about as though it had been a, a trivial thing for him to walk on the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, that he married Jezebel, the son of Ethbaal, king of the Sidonians, and went to serve Baal and worshipped him. She brought in this whole worship of Tammuz, who's in this case called Baal. So he erected an altar to Baal in the house of Baal, which he built in Samaria right there in, his, in the capital city. And they have also made Asherah, thus, remember, it's the woman, the woman is Asherah, the son is Tammuz, or the woman is Semiramis, and the son is uh, Baal or whatever. Thus Ahab did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel than all the kings of Israel who were before him. So wow, that's uh, what, a, what a statement. Turn over to verse chapter 18. We get just kind of a profile of her queenship here. Kind of the way she does things. Chapter 18 or, or chapter 18 to of first Kings. Look down at verse uh, 11. 
So now this is prophet Elijah has been out hiding for three and a half years. It's not rained for three and a half years, and he's now coming back. Ahab has been looking for him everywhere because the land is just absolutely wasting away. I mean, no water has fallen on the land for three and a half years. He's looking for Ahab. He sent out this one servant, his, uh, his servant, I think it's Obadiah, his name, his name is. And he's gone out and find, Elijah actually has found him. And he, he starts saying these things to Elijah, but in this process, he tells us kind of the way Jezebel does things effectively. And he says, now you are saying, go and, and say to your master, behold, Elijah is here, and it will come about that when you leave, when I leave, the Spirit of God will carry you somewhere. He's complaining, I can't go back and tell Ahab you're here, because sure enough, I come back, you won't be here. The Spirit of God will carry you off to who knows where, and I will tell, and when he cannot find you, Ahab will kill me, although I, your servant, have feared the Lord from my youth. Has it not been told to you, verse 13, to my master, that what I did when Jezebel killed the prophets of the Lord? That's what she did? Yeah, she did that I hid hundreds of prophets of the Lord by fifties in a cave and provided them with bread and water. So this is sort of the profile of the way she ran things. She just killed them. She got rid of them. Again, we're learning about this woman here in the Old Testament because Jesus has referred us to her. We understand her. We're going to understand what this woman is doing in this church and what, she, what the, I guess you could say, the, the spirit of her does during the age of this church. The, the age of this church, listen, is the persecution of saints. But they don't come from the outside by the emperors of Rome. They come from the church itself. The church kills its own people. By the hundreds of, hundreds of thousands of people they kill. So keep, let's, let's go to chapter 21. Because we've looked at her profile. Let's look more at her M.O., her modus operandi, how she carries herself out. I want you to pay careful attention to her methodology here because it's going, to be, it's going to be critical for understanding how the medieval church works. So watch here in 1 Kings chapter 21, verses 1 through 16. Now it came about after these things that Naboth the Jezreelite had a vineyard, which was in Jezreel, beside the palace of Ahab of Samaria. So no big deal. I mean, just people on land, and he was one of the landowners. His is next to the palace, though, and Ahab spoke to Naboth and said, Listen, Give me your vineyard, and I will have it for vegetable garden because it's close beside my house, and I will give you a better vineyard than it is in its place. If you like, I will give you the price of it in land. So he just offers to buy it. The guy basically says no. Not, not basically, he flat out says no. He says, the Lord forbid, verse 3, me that I should give the inheritance of my father. So they weren't allowed to buy and sell of their own land because it was passed down from generation to generation. So he really wasn't allowed to do this. Maybe was asked, I mean, I'm sorry, Ahab was asking to do something he was not allowed to do by God. So Ahab came into his house, sullen and vexed, because of the word which Naboth the Jezreelite had spoken to him, for he said, I will not give you the inheritance of my fathers. And he lay down on his bed and turned away his face and ate no food. He's just a big baby. The one that's really rather than show is Jezebel, not him. Watch. Jezebel, his wife, came in and said to him, How is it that your spirit is so sullen that you're not eating food? So he said to her, because I, I'm going to say it in his language. I said to Naboth the Jezreelite, and he said to him, give me your vineyard for money, or else if it pleases you, I will give your vineyard in its place. He said, I will not give it to my vineyard. Just a big old baby. Jezebel, his wife, said to him, do you not reign over Israel? And the answer is no, he doesn't, she does. She's in charge. Do you not reign over Israel? Arise, eat bread, let your heart be joyful, and I will give you the, the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite. How's she going to do it? The way she's done all of this. She just kills people. She has no morals. She has no scruples. So she writes letters. Now pay attention to her MO. This is not the first time, not the last time she does this, I can assure you. She's been doing this for a while. She's very good at it. She's very quick. Notice, she doesn't have to sit around and think of it because this is the way she operates. She wrote letters in Ahab's name, sealed them with his seal. Like I said, who's ruling here? Apparently she is. Sent letters to the elders of the nobles who were living with Naboth in his city. And now she wrote the letters saying, Proclaim a fast and seat Naboth at the head of the people and seat two worthless men before him and let them testify against him saying, You curse God and the king. So it's a total setup. They're going to lie about him in order to get his land. Pay careful attention. This is the MO of the medieval church. Medieval church came to own large portions of Europe using this very MO. All they had to do, David, if they wanted your farm, is to accuse you of heresy. David believes that you should worship devils. How do we know? Because the priests said it. 
So what do we do with David? We burn him at the stake, we take your land. Bingo, that simple. Medieval church did it hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and killed thousands of people. The exact same MO, that's what she does, watch. So the same thing takes place. The man of the city, the elders of the nobles lived in the city, put, did as Jezebel sent them the word, and just as it was written in the letters which he had sent to them, she had sent to them, they proclaimed the fast, seated Naboth at the head of the people, and then the two worthless men came in and sat before him, and the worthless men testified against him, even against Naboth, before the people, saying, Naboth cursed God and the king. It's a total lie, but they say it. So they took him outside the city, stoned him to death with stones. Boom, deal is done. They sent word to Jezebel, saying Naboth has been stoned to death. And he came about when Jezebel heard that Naboth had been stoned to death, that Jezebel went to Ahab and said, Arise, take possession of the vineyard of Naboth, the Jezreelite, which he refused to give for money, for Naboth is not alive but dead. Pay careful attention to that M.O. The church inaugurates during this time a thing called the Inquisition. And it's nothing, you need to know nothing more than that right there, because that was their process. That's all that they did. And they killed thousands upon thousands of innocent people and took over hundreds and hundreds of thousands of acres of land doing that. The church did. The church, not pagan Rome. The church. How did the church get that far from the truth? Well, it's so important, it's so important that you understand history and what's going on here and why Jesus is saying these strict things because, of course, he knew this was going to happen. This fornication, we're back in, back in Revelation. This fornication here that it speaks of this, this woman, of course, probably in that day, it was referring to some physical fornication, but in, in the age of the church, it refers to spiritual fornication. Spiritual fornication is when I put something before God. God is supposed to be the one that I love, and when I love something else, that's spiritual fornication, spiritual adultery. It's me who, who is a part of the church going and selling myself to some other lover, if you will. You see the picture? That's exactly what this woman is doing. She's teaching this fornication and morality in verse 21 there in chapter 2. Uh, verse 22, the promise to throw them into tribulation is really saying something. Like I said, is he saying a lot of these people in the church are not saved? Yeah, that's exactly what he's saying. That's exactly what he's saying. For the first time, the church, it seems the majority of the church, those who call themselves Christians, are not actually Christians. For the first time, not the last time, because we're going to see these letters are from here on pretty much are full of some bad stuff. So, so in Ephesus... Christ's bride doesn't have time for him. That's two letters before. Now in Thyatira, she's in a full-blown affair. And Jesus is calling her to count. First of seven letters to mention, as we said, the second coming uh, by way of the tribulation here. And the promise to overcome her has moved into the body of the letter, which is a major change just in the overall construction of the letter. The first three ages are complete. So Ephesus' age begins and ends after about 40 years. And then begins the age of the Samaritan church, lasts for over 200 years. And then begins the age of the Pergamum church, lasts for about 300 years. And then begins the letter, or the age of the church of Thyatira. That age is not ended. There's another age that has begun, began in the 1500s. And that age has continued also. But the Thyatira age is not, we're still, the church, the church of the Middle Ages is still with us. She is. She's very powerful, by the way. They've been making news. If you said, listen to the Pope, what he did, talked about this week. And by the way, I'm very, very um, encouraging, I guess you could say, is a lot of the church leaders stood up against him. Said, you're, you're speaking things that are against the Bible, saying that homosexuality is, is something that we should approve of. My hat's off to those guys. I mean, good. I'm glad they're standing up for, for the truth. They said, it's not, you're, you're, you're saying something that's against the Bible. I'm glad they're reading the Bible, truthfully. So, so these, these remaining four ages, the Thyatira and on, are ages that begin sequentially, but they exist in parallel. They continue to exist. They don't end like the first three beginning and ending in, in sequence. So Laodicea has the same promise uh, to, to go into the tribulation. Uh, Philadelphian church is the only one promised to be delivered out of the tribulation of the remaining four, Thyatira included. And the, the next church, the Sardis church, Jesus says, I will come to you like a thief in the night. That's not a good term. It says to me, you're not a Christian. That's what he's saying to this church in Sardis. So we're going to get to those next time. So, by the way, speaking of Jezebel, we didn't, we didn't read the, the rest of it. Jezebel gets hers in 1 Kings. Remember how she got it? So Ahab dies, he's shot with arrows, and he dies by the, by, in the field of Naboth. They bury him, or actually he, he bleeds out in the field of Naboth. Uh, but Jezebel continues to be queen, and her son becomes king, and then she gets killed. Remember how she's killed in a very unusual way? Anybody remember it? You get an A 
on, in the class, huh? Fell out a window. What, what happened to her when she fell out? The dogs ate her. In fact, that's exactly what Elijah predicted would happen to her. He said, because you've done this, because you allowed this woman, this is what's going to happen to you, to, speaking of Ahab, this is what's going to happen to Jezebel. Look with me. And again, she's the representative. She represents this woman, this, this female personification of false religion. And of course, there is a female personification of false religion in the book of Revelation. She's called Babylon, isn't she? Remember, that's, that's this false religion. It's all tied together. It came from Babylon. It's going back to Babylon. Let's watch what happens to the woman, Babylon. Turn with me to Revelation. Hold your spot. Chapter 17, verse 16. Revelation 17, 16. So 17, we're introduced to this woman who rides the beast. The beast is the Antichrist. So this woman is the, 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 the woman, if you will, the personification of false religion, doesn't come into her own, into full power until the end. So she's, she's been powerful, but she's going to be uniquely powerful in the regime of the Antichrist. She's, the beast isn't riding her, she's riding the beast. So if I see somebody on the back of a horse, who's in control, the horse or the rider? She's the rider. So it's not the Antichrist initially who's in power, it's, it's this woman, this false religion. So, so anyway, but, but she gets hers here at the, near the end of chapter 17. Let's take a look down there at verse uh, 16. It says, uh, and they gathered them. Oh, there we are. Seven, I'm in reading 16. Okay, 17 verse 16. The ten horns, which you saw, these are ten kings, and the beast will hate the harlot, this woman who rides the beast, and will make, will make her desolate and naked and will eat her flesh. Is a direct link to Jezebel way back there. So the imagery of an actual, this woman is not a figurative person in, in the book of 1 Kings, but she, what, what she is and what happens to her, it plays out in a figurative sense all the way back here near the, near the end of time. And so again, it's just this foreboding, this foreshadowing of what God's going to do to this wickedness and this woman who begins to represent this false Babylonian religion, this false religion which infiltrates the church in Pergamum and becomes the main leader in the Thyatira church, now gets her, she gets hers there at the very end, and she's going to be very powerful and uh, can be traced directly to the city of Rome. We'll, if you'll stay with me in Revelation, probably in three or four years, we'll, we'll, get, we'll study Revel, all of Revelation together, hopefully. God willing. We're not going to do that this time. We're going to stop with chapter 4. So, verse 23. It's interesting. Jesus threatens. We're back in Revelation chapter 2. It's interesting that Jesus threatens pestilence or death. I will kill you with death. Like I said, it seems redundant. It's like, it's already, you're, already, you're going to kill me with death? It seems like you should name what it is. Very, very interesting statement that he makes here because during this time period, the, the reign of the Thyatira church, two different plagues, pandemics, hit the global scene. They're both they're the same plague both times, but they're separated by 300 years. They're both the bubonic plague. In the 6th century, the bubonic plague spreads all over the, the known world kills 100 million people in Europe, Middle East, Africa, and Asia. 100 million people. We're no, we're, what, are, what are our numbers now with this pandemic? I, what's that? 224,000 in our, in our nation, right? Can you imagine 100 million people? Uh, swept, again, bubonic plagues swept through uh, Europe in the 14th and 15th centuries. Bubonic plague ravaged Europe and killed one quarter to one half of all Europeans, roughly 75 million people. Your ancestors, if you're from Europe, were part of the bubonic plague. I guess, you, I guess they survived because here you are. But bubonic plague, of course, was spread by rats and the fleas on rats and it got on the ships and then the ships parked at all these different ports because this was the age of big shipping and, and you know, uh, conquering the world and so these major ports of in England, in Spain, and in uh, um, all the Mediterranean, all the rats began to spread and all their fleas began to spread and people died by the absolute droves. So it's interesting, Jesus, and by the way, what they call the, they call, we call it bubonic plague today. They called it death. That's what they called it. They didn't have a name. Because that's all it was. I mean, you, you, would, you were dead in three days. From the first symptom to the time you're dead, the, the pneumonic plague, which was the stuff that you inhaled, you were dead within three days. On the time you've, you were great three days before, you were in the grave three days later. They called it death. Just coincidence, right? Jesus promised them, I will kill your people, he says to this woman Jezebel, with 
death. And by golly, he did. He did. The depths of Satan, verse 24, because that's, that's the basic teachings of this church. Now, again, not all of them are into these teachings. Don't, don't think I'm standing up here saying all, all Catholics are bad. They're not. There's a ton of Catholics that don't buy into the whole Catholicism. They don't pray to Mary. We've got Catholics within our church here. You know, never, never thought about praying to Mary. That's crazy. Why would I pray to anything but God and trust Jesus as Savior? Sounds like a Baptist to me. It's just Bible. You know, names mean nothing. The word Catholic, guys, just simply means universal. It's, it's not a bad word. The universal, don't you believe in the universal church? I do. The church is everywhere. Everyone who trusts Christ, no matter who they are, what their background, you can put a name on the front of the church, I don't care what they are. If they trust Christ as personal Savior, they're going to be with me in heaven because Jesus has guaranteed all the same ones to, to be with him, that he's gone and made a place for us. But, but again, the doctrines that were brought into the church and that were represented by this woman, this Jezebel, who ultimately becomes this Babylonian uh, horrific imagery thing there in chapter 17, 18, 19, uh, this, this woman is, is satanic. And the doctrines were very satanic. And we're going to see the church, effectively, was ruled by, by Satanists. I mean, there's no other way to put it. But to say every single Catholic was this way, not true. You know, you, know what a Protestant, you know what a Protestant is? They were Catholics. Martin Luther was a Catholic. He, was a do, he had a doctorate degree from a Catholic seminary. He had, had, any, he had any, no intentions whatsoever of being anything but Catholic. They made him be a Lutheran. They, made, they kicked him out. They tried to kill him. Uh, Ulrich Zwingli uh, became uh, uh, John Calvin became the, uh, the Reformed churches. He was, a, he was an ordained Catholic priest. He didn't want anything else but to be a Catholic. He wanted the church to reform. All these horrible things that they were doing, he wanted it over. And they tried to kill him as they did so many and so these guys broke off and they started calling them Protestants because they protested the church and as we're going to see in just a second, you can understand why. They had a lot to protest. You would have done the same thing. Let's remember even though there are many atrocities committed, theological errors during this time. There were many who were true, true believers. And uh, let's also understand that it was during this time, for the, for the most part, the average believer did not have a Bible. Imagine living your whole life never being able to read a Bible. All you ever hear a Bible is what I, the priest, allow you to hear. And if I'm a bad guy, I'm going to give you very little. And I'm certainly not going to give you anything that would keep me from doing what I want to do. But I will keep you under my thumb. Now, if I'm an honest guy, and they were honest, and they were good, they were good priests, and they were good people, and there were, uh, a lot of them became uh, cloistered and went off into monasteries because they couldn't openly uh, live out their faith. So they basically went underground, and that's kind of what happened. The church goes back underground for centuries um, because anyone who stood up and said that the pope or that his leaders were wrong, which they very much were, they lost their heads uh, wholesale. So let's, let's, that's sort of the end of the study of the letter to Thyatira. And there's some other things in here that we could talk about, but I want us to go on here to, um, it's interesting, uh, well, let me also say down in verse 26, the power over the nations. He says, to, who, to him who overcomes, I will give power over the nations. That's the, the whole point, uh, interesting thing of Jezebel, the goal of Jezebel in, in the Old Testament, the goal of the church in medieval times was power over the nations. So it's a juxtaposition to what they were actually trying to do, the bad part of the church, and what Jesus actually is going to do for those who truly believe. He is going to give you power over the nations. So let's, 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 uh, let's append uh, something here to, to the end of this, this conversation to give you just a brief view of history. And what we're going to do here is more, we're going to hit the highlights of what happened during this church by, by basically examining the popes. Uh, not all of them. They were almost 100% bad. Almost 100%, I say that. Not all of them were. But 99% of them were bad. And about 80% of them were really, really bad. Like not a person, um, you know, any, any, any mafia guy from Chicago would have, been, would have been afraid of these guys. These guys were so bad. Uh, by the way, just somebody asked me last time, where do we come up with this, where do I come up with this history? Well, here's a place where you can go to find this history. It's written, in one, among other places, Haley's Bible Handbook. Haley's Bible Handbook is much more replete than the things I'm going to be giving you tonight. But you can go there and you can read these things for yourself, and I would certainly encourage you that, to, to do that. So, so let's, let's get, do a little history. You ready? Constantine converts to Christianity. We talked about that last time in 312 A.D. He conquers in this cross. He sees the cross in the sky. He puts the crosses on his shields, on, on the banners of the, crowd, of, the, of the army. They actually win. He immediately converts to Christianity. As a result, he becomes incensed by all the paganism in Rome. He's the emperor of Rome now. 
And so he, he, he moves the government of Rome from, from the city of Rome to what was called Byzantium. And now today, Istanbul, he called it Constantinople. And he puts out the Edicts of Toleration 3, 313. Uh, and and uh, not his immediate successor, but the next successor, Theodosius I, makes Christianity mandatory. He's the guy that marches all his troops through the river and says, you're all baptized now. And he fills the church with unconverted people. And the church becomes very diluted. The Roman Empire, though, not long after this, begins to crumble. Rome is only, if you're familiar with the four kings or the, or the, four, uh, the four beasts of, of Daniel, these four beasts, the first three are all conquered by the successor. Rome, though, the final beast, she's the final one, she's never conquered. She just begins to crumble. And if you're familiar with Bible prophecy, you know that part of the Bible prophecy is the resurgence of the Roman Empire. It's coming. The Western world is yet to see uh, the pinnacle of the Roman Empire. It's coming. It's going to be led by the Antichrist, but that's another discussion. But Rome, Rome basically crumbles. It fragments and disassociates into its general regions. It becomes what we know today as France and Italy and Germany and England and the Middle East and Turkey. This was all Rome, North Africa. This was all Rome. Uh, and it begins to it becomes fragmented and falls into these uh, representatives. Somebody's talking to me. What's, some, something, whatever that is. And uh, Gregory the first, oh, oh, what, so, so anyway, there's a void in leadership. There's a void in, in power. And uh, uh, because uh, basically the emperors of Rome have ruled for a thousand years. So now there's a void because Rome has crumbled. And so who steps into the void? The Bishop of Rome. The, Ro Rome, is, uh, Rome is at least nominally Christian. So who do they look to leadership? Well, the biggest church in, Rome, the biggest church in, in all, of, all of Christendom now is in Rome. So they look to the Bishop of Rome. And it wasn't a bad thing, at least to begin with. I'm not saying he was a bad guy, but they began to give authority and power to him that they had given to the Roman emperors. And he eventually, you know, uh, oh, you know, absolute power corrupts absolutely, and that's what happened to him. Gregory the first becomes the first official pope. I guess you could say the, the true first true pope. He rules the papacy from 590 to 604 A.D. One of the purest popes, honestly, tries to to hold Christendom to biblical standards. Uh, he truly does. Uh, not a bad guy at all. Labor to purify the church, depose neglectful priests. He opposed the selling of church offices, which you would think, what? So, so I'm elected as pastor of this church because the church voted me in, and they had the right to vote me out, and they should retain that right. But by this time, because of the, remember we studied the Nicolaitans, because of the exercise of authority of people in my position over the la laity people, I eventually took away your power to do that, and now I have total say over the church. And that's fine as long as I'm a good guy. If I would turn out to be a bad guy, you got no power to stop me. And so what I would do, if I was a bad guy, is when I get ready to retire, I would sell my office, despite what you want for a pastor, I would sell my office to the highest bidder. Old Jeff over here wants to pay me a million bucks because he knows my salary's good. So he can buy me out and I'll sell it. You don't want Jeff to be your pastor and I just say on all of you, because I'm in total power here. See what happens? You get off in doctrine, you get off in practice, and then boom, what happens? We start having it. Jeff's not even a Christian. No, no you are Jeff, but. But Jeff's not even Christian. He's just a guy with a bunch of money. So now you've got a guy who bought the place. He owns it. He has say over all of you. He decides whether he's going to give you the Bible or not. He doesn't care whether you follow it or not. What's going to happen to your church? Oh, man. Turns out bad. Well, this guy tries to stop that. Gregory I, hats off to him to, to try to do that. Doesn't, but when he dies, they go right, right back to doing that, selling it to the highest bidder. 857 A.D., greatest literary hoax perpetrated upon the world was perpetrated by the Catholic Church. It's called the Isidorian Decretals. The Isidorian Decretals, you can look them on the internet. Isidorian, I-S-I-D-O-R-I-A-N, Decretals. Uh, they supposedly discovered these documents. I put it in quotes because it wasn't actually true. They, ba they basically falsified everything. Which supposedly taught in the 800s, near 900s AD, taught the power of the papacy in decrees, Decretals. They supposedly were put out in... in uh, uh, what, what was the word? Uh, councils of the church during the second and third centuries. The church didn't have councils during the second and third centuries. The church was completely uh, under, under complete persecution. They didn't meet together for anything. 
But they said supposedly the church did, and the church decided that there had to be popes, and they wrote these documents, and they would burn the edges of it and say they're very ancient, complete. They've, they've foisted this huge uh, uh, hoax upon, upon the world. There was no way to fact check them or anything like that. They exalted the power of the pope, antedated the authority back five centuries. And uh, these falsified documents that they gave the appearance, as like I said, of being ancient, and they are, again, considered to be the largest literary hoax in the world. It was discovered that they were hoaxes. A hundred years later, it was too late. Because now the Bishop of Rome had ultimate power. And he used these, these decretals to do it. The first pope to use it was Nicholas II in 867 AD. He used this fraudulent authority. He claimed to, again, oh, how do we get the pope? Well, I'm telling you how it happened. Because it's not in the Bible. Not at all. Peter was not a pope, and they supposedly wrote letters from Peter, and they were all false, signed Peter's name on all that crazy stuff. It was not. It was a total lie. He claimed to exert supremacy over all churches. Pope, this is Pope Nicholas II in 867, and leaders everywhere. Nicholas uh, excommunicated the Bishop of Constantinople. So the two main leaders of the church at this time were in Rome and Constantinople because I mean, Constantine moved the, the center of government to, to Constantinople. So whoever was the pastor up there or the bishop up there became pretty powerful. And so the churches of the East kind of looked to him. The churches of the West looked to the guy of Rome. Both these guys started acting like a bunch of children, ex, uh, swapped excommunications. I excommunicate you. Well, then I excommunicate you. Well, I excommunicate. Well, I excommunicate. Don't you come to my city? Well, you don't come to my city. They started doing all this childish, stupid stuff. And Nicholas excommunicated the Bishop of Constantinople. Um, for his failure to recognize his position as Pope according to these decretals. And he created the rift that we know today as the Eastern Orthodox Church. The Eastern Orthodox Church became part of the East and the West was all Roman. So it was two churches basically. Eastern Church, Western Church. One was called the Roman Church. The other one was called the Eastern Orthodox Church. The divide was literally the Dardanelles there in, uh, at Istanbul. Uh, Pope Innocent II. There's a couple of innocents here. None of them are at all innocent. Pope Innocent II widened the rift between East and West by sending his armies to destroy Constantinople when the first crusades. He sent them over there just to kill a bunch of people because he could. He didn't like the guy who excommunicated the guy that was in front of him. He was innocently created the dogma of papal infallibility. Pope Innocent did. In other words, the Pope can't do anything wrong. So as opposed to all the leaders of the church, like Peter and Paul, who all confessed they were sinners and were capable of all kinds of sin, this guy said, I can't sin, and I can't say anything that's sinful. And you can't say anything against me because I have these documents that say I'm awesome. And there you go. Things began to spiral down very quickly. The darkest period of the church is 200 years between Pope Nicholas I and Pope Gregory VII. Also called the Midnight of the Dark Ages, the church was directly responsible for this. Directly responsible. Papacy was characterized by open bribery, theft, corruption, Immorality for 200 years. These are the leaders of the truth, supposedly. What's going to happen to your world? E. 904 to 963 AD was called the rule of the harlots. The papacy was referred to as the rule of the harlots by historians because Pope Sergius III from 904 to 911 was supposedly celibate. He didn't have a wife. He definitely was not celibate because he had like a score of mistresses. He basically operated like the kings of the day in which they would have all these concubines and the concubines would have kids and these kids would fill the fill the throne effectively. So he had concubines to fill the throne of the papacy. Uh, among his concubines was a woman, her mother, and her four sisters. He slept with all of them, had children by all of them. Uh, filled the papal chair with illegitimate sons for over 50 years. Just made sure that his sons got to be pope after him. And so where did this come from? Like I said, this corruption is so horrible. Like, God, these guys weren't Christians. Pope Benedict VIII, again, only in name were they Christians. Bought the opus office of the Pope with open bribery. Everybody was cool with it because he had enough money. I, I sold my position as, you know, local pastor to Jeff over here. So why can't I sell the papacy? That's what he did. Bought, or he bought it with open privacy, bri bribery. Pope Benedict IX, you're just going to go through, like I said, these are not not near all of them. I'm just giving you some of the highlights, and they're all dark highlights. Pope Benedict IX was made Pope at the age of 12. Wow. You want a Pope? The leader of the whole church of the whole world being a 12-year-old? What's that going to do to the church? He, as an adult, he committed murders, adulteries in broad daylight. He was driven out of Rome, believe it or not, even though the people were all in favor of that kind of stuff because he was considered the worst of all the popes. Pope Clement II, appointed by the Pope of, 
appointed to be pope by the emperor of Germany because the emperor of Germany, because they could find no one without corruption in the whole city of Rome. No priests, not a single one. They were all completely corrupted. He couldn't find anybody, so he, he appointed this guy, Pope Clement II. Pope Gregory VII undertook a major reform of the church, but they didn't like it because who wants to follow the Bible? We haven't been following it for centuries. They got rid of him. They kicked him out. The only pope that's been kicked out, truly. Pope Innocent III, here's one of these innocents, and he, this guy, wow, talk about a guy who got the wrong name. He's far from anything but being innocent. He ruled the papacy from 1198 to 1216. Is this completely new to any of you? Like you never heard of this before, all th thought popes were always great? Surely not, right? You know, Hitler claimed in killing the Jews, he was doing nothing more than what the church had done for centuries. He was absolutely right. They, you know, the, the word for, the word for um, ghetto is a Greek word, and it was the place where they kept the Jews in Rome, the ghettos. They kept them there. I mean, it's interesting. Hitler did the same thing. He put them in Warsaw and other places, and then went in and killed them, exactly like the popes did. Doing nothing with the Pope. He's like, I do nothing with the things that the popes ever did. By the way, uh, Hitler's, Hitler was Catholic. Did you know that? Never excommunicated to this day by the church. Wonder why. That's just some food for thought. Pope Innocent III, let's get to this guy. Most powerful Pope who ever lived. I would submit he's the most powerful man who has ever lived to this day. Pope Innocent III claimed to be the, quote, vicar of Christ. That's the same title the Pope holds today. Among, among other bad titles, this is one of the worst ones. He, he calls himself the uh, Pontifex Maximus, like I said, is a title of a pagan, pagan emperor, pagan, pagan high priest. He also holds the title of the Vicar of Christ, and that was invented by this guy, Pope Innocent III. Vicar means in place of. I am in place of Christ on this earth. So when I speak, it's as if Jesus is speaking. That's the same title that the Pope holds today. Vicar, you hear it in Latin, which is what it is, doesn't mean a lot to you. If I said it in Greek, you would recognize it. Antichrist, you recognize that? It's the same word. So they have, so you have a guy in Rome with the title of Antichrist. Anti doesn't mean against, by the way. It means in place of. It means he sees, he sees himself as the earthly replacement of Jesus. You, you can pray directly to me because I represent Jesus on the earth. That's the doctrine of the Catholic Church. One of, one of them. Like I said, not all Catholics hold to that. A lot of Catholics would just say, sure, I don't believe that stuff. I go straight to God through Jesus. Like I said, you must be Baptists then. Because that's what we believe. That's what Bible believers believe. Uh, vicar, like I said, is a Latin in place of. He claimed to be, here's Pope Innocent III, he claimed to be, quote, the supreme sovereign over the church and the world, end quote. He claimed also that all things, quote, in heaven and in earth and in hell are subject to the vicar of Christ, he said, Pope Innocent III. The most powerful man who ever lived. Never in history has any man exerted more power than Innocent III. Practically all the monarchs of Europe and Byzantium bowed the knee to him. He commanded greater armies and had say over more money than anybody ever has, including all the emperors of Rome. This guy. He ordered two crusades. He condemned the Magna Carta. He forbade the reading of the Bible and the language of the people. This is, this is the hallmark of the Catholic Church, up until recently. He instituted the Inquisition. He ordered the extermination of heretics. By the way, a heretic was anybody who disagreed with him. So that's not true, because it says in the Bible such and such, and you would get whoosh, burned at the stake. And he did it wholesale. More blood is shed under this Pope, Innocent III, and that of his immediate successors than any other period of the Church, except for when the Church tries to put down the Protestant Revolution. revolution. Reformation, there's the word. Again, Hitler described himself as doing the same thing the church had already done, and he was exactly right. Pope Leo IX, 1513, he's the Pope of the Reformation. He, he ruled the papacy from 1513 to 1521. He's the guy that goes and tries to kill Martin Luther. He tries to kill, he actually does kill Ulrich Zwingli. Uh, uh, kills, a, kills a lot of Christians, and his successors do as well. He's the Pope uh, of Martin Luther and the Protestant Reformation. He was made Archbishop, this Pope Leo was, at the age of eight. He's made Cardinal at the age of 13. Do you understand why they protested? Why, why a guy like Luther, as he reads the Bible, starts saying, who are these guys? And why are they doing what they're doing? And by the way, they're not the first to, to protest. Don't think Luther, well, why wouldn't, somebody, why wouldn't somebody stand up against this? They did, guys, and they killed them by the scores. By the thousands and thousands and thousands, the Inquisition just, I mean, talk about a bloody institution. 
And by the way, it's still on the books of the Catholic Church. It's never been repealed. They're just not enforcing it. It's still on the books. Pope Leo was, like I, said, like I said, Archbishop at the age of eight, made Cardinal at the age of 13. As a 13-year-old, he appointed 27 church offices. You want your 13-year-old appointing anything? He appoints 27 high offices within the church, not only in Rome, but other places. So, wow, no wonder they protested. As a pope, he appointed cardinals as young as age of seven, because he could. He reaffirmed that every human being must be subject to Rome and the papacy for salvation. I thought we were subject to Jesus. Like I said, these guys consider themselves what they have as being in place of Christ. He declared the burning of heretics to be a divine appointment. So, and, and they did that. And we're going to look next time, we're going to start looking next time at the Protestant Reformation in the city of Sardis. And that's going to be our, our next letter. We'll see what happened there. Again, the Protestant commentators have had a field day with this letter, Thyatira, because it obviously points to the Catholic Church. And, and indeed, except for the letter of Thyatira, the age of, it's definitely the age of Catholicism. It, but if we accept the letter of Thyatira to the age, as the age of Catholicism, we have to accept the letter of Sardis as the age of Protestantism. Jesus doesn't have a single good thing to say to that letter, to those people. Not one. We get all high and mighty about being a Protestant, and yeah, let's get those Catholics kind of thing. Well, wait, your day is coming. And Jesus had nothing good to say to the Sardis church. So I will say this, he, he had some good things to say to, to the Catholic church of the Middle Ages, and, and they did a lot of good things with no Bibles. They were completely under the thumb of the leadership of these Nicolaitan priest type of leaders who were a lot of times evil guys. And so, so to be an honest, heartfelt Christian in those days was really rough, and they, there was a lot of them who were, and they suffered dearly, dearly for it. But the, the, the age of the church at Sardis was an age of open Bibles, and they were hardly any better than the previous age. So with open Bibles, they committed the same atrocities. So the same, why it's, it's a little bit different when you know what the Bible says and you don't do it anyway. As opposed to, I don't even have a Bible, I've never even read one, and I do things that I shouldn't do. There's, there's, a, there's a difference in accountability. Make sense? And that's why Jesus is going to be so harsh uh, to the Sardis church. And so we're going we're gonna to make sure that the Protestants get theirs here uh, next time. So we'll stop right there, and we're going to pray, and then we're going to take questions. Let's pray. God, we thank you for the things that we're learning, and um, God, we know that all this history you're familiar with, you see... Uh, centuries ago as if it happened today. And so we're asking for the understanding that we need. I don't think we need to understand everything that happened, but partly we need to know because, because you've given us this. And our eyes need to be open to the truth. We need to see what happens when we allow ourselves to have a reasonable compromise with things in the world and what it, the kind of corruption and horribleness it can lead to. And true for that church, it can be true for any church. Thank you, God, for speaking to us. Help us to take these warnings to heart. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for visiting. Find us at www.islandbaptistchurch.org.